2,110 objects. And I know this exactly um, because I decided to catalogue everything I wanted to. Um, it all stemmed from sort of moving into a smaller flat and trying to downsize and throwing out a couple bags of things and realising I'd only taken off the top layer. There was still the sediment of objects that I never really looked at and never really did anything that I felt I needed. So I decided to photo everything and write in the database uh, what it was, um, where it's kept, um, when I got it, uh, how I got it, and why I kept it. And I think it was the last one I was most interested in the time. Um, um, it started off with me having to classify what I decided an object was. Because I, I hit the problem to start with socks. Um, when I came across a pair of socks, I photographed it as a thing. And when I came across a single sock, I also photographed it as a thing. It was, they were both objects. Um, and I think I figured it was possession. It was how I found them. So a pair of socks were found as one thing. They were used together. Um, but a single sock was on its own. And even when I found them, it's made later. I didn't redo the entry. I kept them separately. And it had me thinking that uh, an object, and so sort of being possessed, is as much a use as anything else. You have objects that you just keep for sentimental reasons. There's nothing intrinsically useful about them, but they have no value to anyone else. Like looking at Marx's um, use and exchange value, I didn't feel like my sentimental objects fell into either category. They were more into the Bordel Arts work, is looking at the possession of objects as a use and as a value. So I started off having to think about sort of where it was, and I had five distinct areas <coughs> in my sort of black surroundings. And bedroom was a massive one, which I imagine is for most people in shared building. Um, and it's cupboard, it's a big storage cupboard, a uh, kitchen, a studio, and a hall. Um, I noticed the bathroom isn't in there. Um, it's because my bathroom is tiny, there's no storage space at all. So only sort of very transient objects get in there, it's only the toothpaste and the shampoo. So I made a decision quite early on not to not to catalogue anything that I didn't feel I possessed. So I didn't catalogue food in the cupboards, and I didn't catalogue um, the toiletries and things like that, because they weren't really my objects, they weren't my possessions, they were things that came and went through the house, they were used and disposed of, and I felt any connection to them. And, um, it also got me thinking about what, what I mean when I talk about home, and I realised that I'm quite an object-based person. That I don't feel home is the building. I feel home is the arrangement of objects. So it's my duvet on my bed and my books on my shelf and my food in the freezer. And that's that's my surroundings, that's what I've created. And it was these I was thinking about this made me wonder about how much I'd created my surroundings or how much my surroundings had dictated what I did. Um, being in a rented accommodation, again a lot of things are decided for you. Uh, the bed is in the bedroom. So it's appropriate to sleep there. Your activity has already been decided by your placement of objects. And then the smaller objects follow the larger ones, so things associated with the bed. Um, sort of books for reading, clothes, makeup, all into the bedroom, um, pamphlet in the kitchen. But some of the smaller ones that have followed my own activities around the flat, uh, makeup mirrors and things, would go where I use them rather than using them where they were. Um, so I think it's a mixture of both, but it's mostly dictated before. And Daniel Miller talks about this as the humility of objects, but the less you see them, the more influence they have over your life. The, as much as you take them for granted, they dictate the situation, they dictate the appropriate activities. Um, another nice part of keeping everything in a table was um, the flattening of my possessions into so something I could reorganize quite easily. And getting them in chronological order was quite good. Um, seeing how much was sort of only a couple of years old and how much it actually survived sort of since I was a kid. And there's a general trend of it being majority in the last sort of two years and they're getting smaller and smaller as they go back. And I had, I had a few theories about um, what I was going to find out when I was doing this work. But one of them was uh, that the majority of items I owned before the year 2000 were going to be presents. And it's because I didn't have any personal income at that point as a kid uh, before high school. Uh, I didn't have a job, I didn't sort of pocket money was the thing. And so everything was kept, I and mean, mostly the sentimental things are kept were presents. But after 2000, uh, the bought category sort of spikes and keeps going up. And I figured that was because in 
high school, shopping was, it was like the social activity. It's what we did every week. And it's easy to brush that off as some mimicry of American television, being told that it's the popular girls that go shopping and they look pretty and buy things. Um, but it's also that, so shopping and consuming is a neutral space, and started sort of from the first department stores. It's a place where sort of young women could go on their own without chaperone or authority and be seen as like normal. That was fine. You didn't have to worry about sort of where you're going. You could do anything you wanted and it, for the reason you weren't being looked after the whole time. I think it was the first bit of freedom with shopping as child. And that's the social aspect of it. There's also, I remember when I was younger, the actual items you bought uh, were important. Um, I wouldn't say as a teenager I was more superficial than I am now. That's not really fair because when I was younger, I had less life experiences to define me from the next person. So it had to be signifiers, it had to be objects or pieces of clothing or something that made me different or maybe me um, and could be easily recognised. And I, I don't believe I don't believe clothes are superficial. Uh, I agree again with Daniel Miller's decisions. They are. You're taught not to judge someone on what they look like. Um, but on what they do and what they decide to do. And um, what you decide to wear and what you decide to present to the world, I think should be taken into consideration as much as sort of who you are. Because it's still, it's another, it's another decision you made, another front you put on, whether it's lots of effort or whether it's no effort at all, it still tells you something about the person and the situation. So, as I was saying, bought massive category. Um, it never went into decline after high school. I, just, I, I love shopping. I consider it one of my hobbies. I think. Um, but I, I started looking deeper into sort of why I shopped, and I came up with three, sort of three categories. And the first one was neat. When I ran out of food or had a hole in my work shoes, I needed something, and I went to the shops. And the next one was social. That element again sort of never went away. Uh, particularly for sort of family shopping is still quite a big thing. And the, the last one was want. Um, I wanted to go shopping, I wanted either something, or I wanted the experience and the activity of shopping. Um, and the other thing I had to think about was sort of why I made choices I did when I was shopping. What, so what made me buy the things I did buy? And again, I thought of three reasons. I, I like working on threes. Um, first one was sort of positive reinforcement, uh, personal experience. So there's things I bought that have been good in the past, I assumed would be good again. Um, the second one was recommendation, whether it was sort of verbal, someone telling me it's good, my dentist recommending me a mouthwash, or whether seeing someone else using it and sort of being happy with it. Um, and the third one was advertising. Of course, there's no way to get away from it. Um, I think it's it's quite subliminal in a lot of ways. Just the arrangement of colours or shapes to make you believe something's better than its competitors without any real proof. And I have uh, my best example of that is being in an airport, um, sort of shattered on a uh, change between flights. And I spent a while sort of standing around in a duty free shop looking for a drink. And I came out with a bottle of Coke and had to sit and remember I don't like Coke. And I've never liked Coke. <laughs> and about once or twice a year I buy it because um, it's sort of it's everywhere. And I noticed when I sat back down in that airport that I was, for the past four hours I've been sitting under a sign that said, or your flight to have a refreshing cook. And it must have just seeped in. <laughs> so, after I finally got to the why I kept it, which was a bit I was really interested in starting with, um, and to, to find my categories for that, I started off with the wrong word. I started off with the word necessity, um, and discovered that necessity was basically a blanket and a pot and a spoon, and that was it. And then after that I thought maybe necessary for comfort. Um, but then there was some clothes and a few toiletries and a few more pots and spoons. But it wasn't still right, so I thought maybe necessary for society. Um, things you needed to, because I'd be fine for a while with my blanket and my pot and my spoon. But I'd run out of money for rent very soon. So I had to hold down a job. So I had to have a certain level of dress and a certain level of hygiene. And then there's also, society isn't just working and living, it's also being involved in the culture. So I had to have um, sort of entertainments, DVD players, TV, sofas, for people to come around. Um, and eventually I gave up on necessity and I went back to use. But I couldn't even stick with one for use. I had to have use for things I use maybe every day or every couple of days. Um, use entertainment.
entertainment. I couldn't quite bring myself to put in the use category. DVDs and Xboxes and things I used a lot but didn't really justify as really necessary. I, I wanted to use that word. Um, and the other one, which was a surprise, was use future. Um, I put that in just as a, I thought it would be a small category. I thought it would just be a few things I kept in case they were important later. And it turned out to be pretty much half of my stuff is kept just in case. And it made me a bit worried. Um, I think it's, it's a, um, an underlying insecurity about the future. And it's, it's quite clearly a hoard. Um, when I started working this, I thought of my objects a bit as uh, my collection. Things that um, belonged to me or possessed by me and had that in common. And I realized it wasn't. It was, it was a hoard. A lot of my stuff is kept just in case times turn bad. Um, like salting jerky. Um, and uh, it's made me realize I want to get rid of it a bit. I think I'm starting to get quite, quite worried about having such a lot of, a lot of things that I don't need at the moment. And also the other thing from the why kept it category is 147 items that I don't know why they're in my flat. And that, that struck me as boring. Unknowns in any of the other categories were just a lapse in memory. They were I don't know when I've got it or I can't remember as to how I got it. But these were items that I just, I couldn't, I didn't understand why they were there. A few of them were sort of types of holes in them I should have thrown out a while ago. But there were quite a few very strange ones. Uh, this one is my favourite. Um, uh, item 1153, which I just, I had no idea. I had never seen it before I started cataloguing. And I later found out it was a bike spanner. And I haven't had a bike since I was 13. And I, I have no idea why I was there, but I have started to quite like it. So on a very small level, um, the project was about my consumption and uh, the consumer society that I found myself in. Um, but no man's an island, and I didn't want to. I wanted it to be that at, at the time. But my consumption doesn't just affect me. There's a whole chain behind it. Um, we're not a, a production-based country. Um, it has to come from somewhere. It has to come from somewhere in great mass for everyone else like me who wants to buy it. And I. I really didn't, I didn't want to talk about it, so James Williams talked for a freeze, so to finally placed it in my head why I didn't want to, because I've been, I've been ignoring it, which is very different from being ignorant. Um, I knew about all the issues, but I've been actively suppressing them in my head so I could continue doing what I wanted to. Like, I know all about um, the sweatshops and things like that, but I still shop in free market because I want to. And it's a very different, it's a very different system. And I haven't, I still haven't quite I got it all straight in my head. Um, I think I'm still fighting against the uh, denial that I keep pushing back. And as well as um, to the denying these things, I also find myself feeling a bit powerless to change them. The idea that if I didn't buy it, then there'd be someone else who would. Um, that I don't have enough power in myself to change anything. So why, like, why, why bother? Um, and it's. It's something I'm still becoming. I'm overcoming very small ways at the moment. I think um, I'm probably going to get rid of my hoard. And I've been looking more at altering clothes and so sort of producing things myself rather than relying on uh, consuming. Because I can't quite justify everything in my head right. I can't quite it all so straight. Um, and it's a, an interesting term that's come about recently is the prosumer. Um, someone who makes their own items. And so uh, where all the digital printing is coming in. 3D printers, I think, are going to change a lot of that from the plastics department. Um, when I started this project, I remember saying to someone um, that I don't think it'll change me. That I think I'll just have a catalogue of everything I own and a snapshot of my place in my consumer culture. And I was dead wrong. Obviously, everything's already started changing a bit, but saying all those things, I don't find, I don't see it as evil. I don't see there anything wrong with consumer culture because the amount of technological advances in sort of building in medicine that we've had from just this want, this desire for more and better, um, it can't be sort of pushed aside. And I don't agree with the sort of theories that we should stop. That we should stop wanting that enough is enough and we should just be content with what we have and try and move backwards. Because um, that obviously didn't work in the past. I think it's the desire for more and better and cleaner and more efficient that's sort of going to help these things. So I, I, I am 
part of my culture, and I do, I do have a place in my side, but I think I want to change it. 